Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Creative Spaces. In this week's episode, we have the guys from Cron. They're a live electronic duo based here in Los Angeles. They've done music for movies and they've done their own electronic music, but then they also have a phenomenal rig that they take out and play live. They take us through everything they use in their production as well as the whole setup they have for their live rig. So let's go check out their creative space. Hi, we're Cron. We're from Los Angeles, California, and this is our very clean studio. <laughs> Beyond clean. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who do you make? You make music under Cron. Do you do it in any other project? Yeah, my name's Sean. This is Michael. Michael. Um, we've been making music for a long time together. Um, and this is like the boiled down, refined version of our studio setup after many, many years. Awesome. And uh, you said you do music for live product. You did like live shows, but then you also did scoring as well. Yeah, Cron is like like a. We've always been consider ourselves like a, a AV audio visual project, but uh, we've kind of divided our time recently between like live shows that are a little more industrial and dancey electronic and more i don't know what would you call it like horror synth kind of yeah it's a blend of house techno all sorts of electronic music psychedelic industrial we kind of just do our own thing we're not trying to be any sort of particular genre as such so yeah and we, we've got commissioned to do a couple cool soundtracks with with people that that like our sounds we've done some weirdo videos like long form science channel videos, like stuff like that, where we do ambient music. So we've had a chance to flex a lot of different styles that we like to make. And we don't really, we try not to box ourselves in. We kind of just do whatever we want. It's always been the, the plan. Awesome. And you said th this studio is split into kind of a live and the studio spot? Yeah, so basically everything, everything on this half of the studio is the live cron setup. And we bring all of this shit in a truck <laughs> to our shows and perform with it, including lasers, lights, everything. Pretty much everything on this half, bring fucking plants with us too. Like we, we don't care. We're trying to bring people into the cron world. Like a lot of the, a lot of the artists that we listen to, like it's about world building. You know, there's no vocalists in cron. So we rely on visuals, sounds and, and design, sound design and world building as like our core, awesome. right? Does that sound? Does that make sense? Yeah, we've, yeah. we've brought incense to shows. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Like we're- The whole vibe. Me and Mike were talking about how to like build a tasting menu that went with the set. Like we were just like trying to think of anything that we could do to heighten the sensory experience. Yeah, awesome. Know? Yeah. So you use everything when you're in the studio, but then a certain section goes out with your live? Yeah, so everything in the studio is currently wired up uh, audio and MIDI. So you have access, you could play the drums with the Trap Cat to play the rhythm. You could play this keyboard to play the Moog One. Like it's all over the place. And I want it that way because when me and Mike work, this is like a mostly a standing up studio and we're like kind of frenetic. Like we work really quickly and get ideas out like that. So I wanted everything to be able to control everything. Everything was plugged in, ready to go, ready to go through the sends at any time. So yeah, so everything is at our disposal for, for whatever we want, but mostly this half is what we're bringing to shows and playing live and kind of jamming with. Okay, so this is like the percussion zone. Um, I played with this guy who was one of the most incredible drummers and he used this Trap Cat and I had played a lot of really shitty drum pads before. This thing feels amazing. I'm not a drummer myself, but as far as expressive control, it feels good to play this. Um, and then the Nord is sitting on top of it, just as like, this is a, as far as like a single unit, this thing is absolutely insane. You can run six sounds, it's FM wavetable, and it's chaos. It's so, so good. Um, really, really nutty tones, like stuff that you can't get from other drum machines. And the kicks, because they're like FM based kicks, I swear to God, they hit harder than anything I've ever heard. We sample it a lot. Like a lot of this stuff on this side, even if we don't use it for the live setup, we're gonna bring the samples into the analog rhythm and just run them, um, just because they're so good. And for any of the any of like the 
soundtrack production stuff, we just use it all over the place. I think um, I think uh, Richard Devon uses one of the Nord drums. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, there's um, there's a couple M Max MSP guys that have created custom scripts for these that will randomize the settings and do insane stuff with it because it's a full-on drum synthesizer. This is not. This is not just a preset machine. This is like a, they, they call it a modeling percussion synthesizer. And it's, this is like the third version of the, the Nord drum and then they've discontinued them a while back, but my God, absolutely insane sounds. Awesome. Yeah, and then you can, so yeah, like, like I said, you could use this pad controller to play this. You could use this pad controller to play the analog rhythm, vice versa. Like everything is interchangeable. It's all MIDI routed and you know, you kind of just arm the track that you want it to go to. Like it's it's all it's all for you, um, Mike. You can talk about the lyra because you. I was like hesitant on this stuff when I first saw it. Like the lyra came out, and then the pulsar was like announced shortly after. And if, when I was like listening to it, I was like, "Is this something that I need?" It seems like a one-trick pony. Like, you know, like is it flexible enough to use on a lot of stuff? And I don't know. Mike, yeah, I saw Nick Bat do a demo of that, and uh, I was sold and then we went to perfect circuit i tried it out and i was like yeah this is insane madness pure psychedelic you can you can do super subtle drones or you can just go batshit crazy with it and i love it and then sean finally was convinced about yeah. these things yeah after playing the lyra i was like i have to have everything they make you know and then i heard more and more of the pulsar and it is a very limited drum synth but that's only limited to your create creativity. It's it's infinitely patchable. The raw sound of it is mental. It is so destructive and so insane. It is beautiful. It's and it's like built like a tank. Like you toss this down the stairs and it'd be fine. You, you met um, the guy that that who's that company is that of uh, uh, Vlad. Uh, I'm not the not the owner the the US rep guy. No, no, I don't know him. Super nice guy. You know him? Yeah, that's yeah. cool. I met him at the, Synth yeah so after after i got the pulsar um and we kept using it and i've, I've toyed around with patching it a bunch just to get like generative kind of percussion stuff mostly now if we come up on something that feels like it needs it we're sampling the kicks the snares or the percussion bringing it into the analog rhythm or we can use it as just like a pure texture synth and you can even run midi into it to run it as a bass synth and it's nasty this thing is so good. This is just, the, the Lyra is just pure, like we wrote for an art installation, we wrote like 36 minutes of music. Um, every six minutes, the motifs changed into a different lighting and audio kind of vibe. And we use this for an entire like six minute track. And basically just, to, you have to hand tune all the notes. Like you can never really go back to the same thing that you did, but that's, the beauty of it that's yeah. why we like modular that's you know so you just hand tune it try to get it as close as you can it's sometimes it's infuriating but when you get it right it's gorgeous it's not supposed to be perfect it's supposed to be drifting and off and yeah it's insane it's it's like a wall of sound and we're running it a lot through um some effects that i'll show you later yeah. um just to give it some some air but it's it's a beautiful synth Awesome. Yeah, Mike got me on that. And then I got the, the the Soma pipe after that. And we use this. I was like kind of confused on how to use it or what to use the, the Soma pipe for. And then we did this project recently where we did a live score to uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is like, a, was it 1940? 1920. 1920, 1920 uh, silent film. It's credited as like the, the first horror movie ever made. And it's, it's like, it looks goofy and hokey now if you look at it, but back in the day, it scared the shit out of people. It's like really impressive. It's really good. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And they restored it recently. And so we did, for this theater company out in Culver City, we did like a live score to, to the screening of the film. And I used that on pretty much the whole hour and 15 minutes of it, just as a texture thing. The Nord drum, we had a really limited set of tools that we wanted to use. Um, but that thing, we just, I just turned it into like a, a base layer for everything and just let it scream. And it's, it's wild. Nice. Yeah. Does um, it move along a bit more? Yeah. So I have bought and sold the Minotaur like four times. <laughs> and this is like my fourth one. I, I'll just keep it now because I, 
I always feel like I have overlap with other stuff, but then when I don't have it, it's there's nothing that sounds like this. I've had um, every flavor of Moog, sub fatty, little fatty, slim fatty, sub 37, Voyager, Voyager XL. Basically, I got a Matriarch Moog 1, the Minotaur for like, I think you can get them for like $300, three to, three to $400 used. It, it's, it will knock the paint off the walls. It's crazy, it's, it just does the thing. No. That's it. Yeah, so it's staying now, I'm, I won't sell it now. Yeah, we recently sampled that for one of the, the newest track that we're working on. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's violent. <clears throat> And that's just raw. Like you don't have to do anything to it. It just sounds like that. It's crazy. Um, you should tell the Mellotron story. Yeah, okay, so the Mellotron, me and Mike use samples of the Mellotron forever. We're obsessed with like old horror film, like scores like Lucio Fabio Fulci, Fritzi. Fabio Fritzi, uh, like, like classic horror movie soundtracks. And there's a lot of Mellotron on those. Um, Day of the Dead. Zombie uh, by Fulci. Yeah, zombie by sure. Lucio Fulci. Really big choral sounds warbly like choruses a ton of voices and you can really only do that with a mellotron and it's because you, you know they used to run like cassettes inside and they were more or less tape machines inside running loops yeah it's a crazy technology and obviously uh, a real mellotron is like absolutely out of our budget so i found this on craigslist and i hit up this guy he's in long beach it was an insane deal and i was like all right i'll come pick it up i'll be there I go to this guy's house. You know, I like to, when I buy something on Craigslist, I like to go, all right, here's the money, talk to you later, and then leave. This guy's like, hey man, come on in. Check out the synths, I got some other cool stuff. I go up to this guy's house. I'm there for like two hours. He's like smoking cigarettes in his house. Yeah, and I got this amp, I built this amp. Fucking restore this all like, I'm talking to this guy for literally two hours. And you know, it's like, I'm like, all right. At that point, I just wanted to pay him so I could get the fuck out of there. I get this synth home and it's like, it like stinks really bad in my car. And I'm like, I'm like driving home, like with the windows open. From cigarettes. From fucking cigarette smoke. Oh. So I get home, I completely disassemble this thing. There's ash inside of it and it <laughs> reeks. It re it stinks so bad. I cleaned the whole thing out with like rubbing alcohol and shit. It stunk for like months. I had to replace the screen on it cause it was up this guy like i i would have gladly paid full price to not have to ever speak to that person but it works and i have it let's hope he doesn't watch this video yeah, <laughs> asshole yeah it's great condition like there's a little something wrong he was like yeah there's a little something wrong with the screen the second screen just smashed in half and i was just like dude just here take this six hundred dollars or whatever let me let me leave <laughs> it was um, worth it though because this thing it was rips. Worth it. yeah we use it all the time it's it's a really it's like one of those things where it's like you know, do we need this thing? Is it a one trick pony? But like, if the sound is so perfect, you know, and it's, this is from Mellotron, it's their sample libraries yeah. is what you're paying for. And Mike and I are like hardware dudes. We don't use a lot of plugins. So having this in a keyboard that you can just play or play with this or whatever you want is just insane. It sounds like so, you can blend two of the, the samples together too. So uh -huh. you have, you have like a mix knob that'll pull in you know, two different choirs or a piano and a vibraphone or something. And we use it all the time. It's really cool. I didn't, I didn't think you guys were hardware guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, not, we're not specifically like analog purists. Like we, we actually prefer like, you know, like the Pro 2 or so, a lot of these other synths, like digital oscillators through analog filters. That's kind of like our jam. Like we, we love like crunchy 90s tones. Like when me and Mike first started jamming, he was all on a, RM1, Yamaha RM1X or Yamaha RS7000. And that was yeah. your shit for years. Yeah. So we like really crunchy digital tones. So we're not like, like this, the Roland D05 here. I, you know, these were like. That three. doesn't have analog filters. No, not analog it? filters. But no. you can run it through but the But we, we can run stuff. it through some other stuff to, yeah. to give it a little bit of body. But this thing is almost identical to the, the D50, the Roland D50. The Boutique series is really, really good. I think I paid $300 for this and we use it all the time. Just, it's a pain in the ass to program, but I have like, you know, there's a bunch of really good um, preset libraries. Like I think um, Lego Welt did one yep. and they're all on here and they're very, very good. So 
you can get like this really great, it's, a, it's like a, a vector synth. So you can sweep this little joystick here and, and swap between a bunch of different wavetables. And it's, it's beautiful, it sounds really good. It does a thing. Yeah, again, this is like stuff that we don't, no, we wouldn't normally bring out with us live. Um, you know, for something like this, it's kind of like, it's, it's not the most practical thing to play a show with, you know, cause you have to like hand tune oscillators, unless that's your thing. Like for us, we play a lot of melodic, um, we play a lot of melodic stuff. So it's, it's hard to, you're mostly gonna get big washes of sound. So like something like this, preset machines, we can always just sample them. And that's normally what we're doing. We'll bring samples into, um, into Mike's um, Machine Plus or into the analog rhythm and use them there. Yeah. And then this guy is absolutely insane. It's by a company called Tasty Chips out of the Netherlands. Um, this is a granular synth. Uh, I think Dave Stone has one. Did he have one in his, yeah. in his studio? Yeah. This kind of blew my mind. I had used granular synths just only in plug-in form. And as far as I know, these guys were like the first uh, hardware granular synth out. And the whole thing runs on like a Raspberry Pi inside. It's so it's so insane. But you have this 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 basically like a crossfader. It allows you to sweep through your waveforms, and you can import your own audio files. You can record audio files. Uh, you can live record audio files. We're mostly using it as a really big texture synth because you can just draw out grains of sound forever and just pull them out. And I remember the first time I brought it home, and I was like, Mike, here, listen to this shit. He was in, you were going insane. It was like crazy. Yeah, uh, you brought that off for Caligari, right? Yeah, we used, uh, when we did the, the Dr. Caligari live score, this was one of the things that I was playing. And it was mostly just a lot of weird. You, you only had it on one patch, the whole I had one patch, thing. the whole score. And I was sweeping through a re the, the resonant filter and kind of adjusting parameters and just tweaking where the audio file was playing. It was a bunch of like more atonal or percussion kind of sounds. Yeah. So I could, no matter where I was, I was gonna get something that sounded crazy. And I was running it through this this dual, uh, this Ventress dual reverb. And and it was like a distorted kind of multi-band distortion reverb. And this thing is crazy. It's crazy. It's it's. Like you can you can technically use you can use it like four it has like four voice multi timbral but we're mostly using it for the hardware as is we're not usually playing like melodic lines on it it's mostly just ambient texture like like a bass layer underneath a lot of this stuff yeah. uh, but you can play it as like a full melodic synth you know like you can you can you can play four voices it's insane I've had a bit of a go at um, Perfect Circuit they've got one set up. It's hard, it's hard to do it in like a demo session. You really gotta like sit down with it because the settings are pretty deep. Yeah. Um, but it's it's beautiful. Yeah, right off the bat, like it sounds cool. Like it doesn't sound like anything you you ever used. Yeah. And then you uh, have the beast. And then the Moog One, the 16 voice Moog One. Oh God, where did I begin? Um, we got this. Right when they came out, I want to, uh, what was that? What would have been 2018 or 2019? Was it before Children of the Cross? Yes, yeah, so it was It was right at the beginning 20, of- 2020, they had, had it at the Moog house. They had one of them. Yeah, we, it was- um, And so it would have been just after that. Ah, oh man, I can't remember. No, it would have been, it would have been like- Cause you had to sell a bunch of stuff. Yeah, it would have been like 2019. And, and I had, Right before I got this, I had I had to make a decision. I was like, I have too much stuff in this studio and just like the, the cost of this is ridiculous. So I was like, I had an OB6 keyboard and I had a Voyager XL. And I had to make the call if I was gonna let those go to get this. I'm glad I did. I still miss my Voyager XL because it's special. And I miss the OB6 for very specific things. There's, you know, the Moog one's extremely capable, but there's certain shit that the OB6 does that just nobody else does. And we have a Prophet 6 over here, which kind of fills in a little bit of those blanks, so I don't feel as bad about it now, um, but it's incredible. So when we were doing Children of the Cron, um, we used it all over the production. We used, we, almost every track had um, like, a bass, a lead, and a pad from it. 
we almost were, we every single. We brought it out for the show. Yeah, yeah. So when we when we we were asked to perform this live, which was a whole other thing that took us months and months of preparation, um, light show, everything that went along with it, but setting everything up instead of just like sampling everything and playing to a backing track or something, we actually ran almost all of the tracks live, and that basically meant we were running the Moog one in like a tri-tamporal mode. And basically you can have three dedicated MIDI channels set and you can even change the outputs. Like you have a, um, you have multiple outputs that you can use. You can use your main stereo outputs and then you have subs that don't even go through the effects or anything like that. So I would run like the bass through that and then run the leads and the pad through a separate output so you could keep them separated on the mixer. And it, yeah, it's insane. You what know? was that one patch that it would always pitch out of pitch? Okay. We so, had to eventually sample yeah, it and put so it in the backing track. They're still working on this thing, and I really hope they keep developing for it, because it's not, the software still has a little bit to be desired. There's a couple patches on there. I would, every time I would bring up the patch, it would just like start to dive bomb in pitch. It was the weirdest fucking thing. I we could never figure it out. Too. Yeah, we, we would send it chords. Same, literally changed nothing in the synth. No firmware updates, no changes in the MIDI or anything. And all of a sudden, one day it's just like, nah. It just starts dive bombing the pitch only on this one particular preset. Don't know why. Don't know why everything was saved perfectly. It's getting all its program changes. It's doing the thing and it just fucking dies. So it's had some service. It's happier now. It was a saga, but I'm happy to you have it back. You got a voice card replaced? Yeah, I got a voice card replaced on it, um, which I was a little worried about because, you know, shipping a $8,000 synth across the US is not my favorite thing. Um, but I'm happy to have it back. We use it a lot and it's, it's, my God, when it clicks, it sounds so unbelievable. The pads are unbelievably huge. You can do everything. You know, it's got, it's got a little bit of every, every Moog in there. Yeah. And as far, for something that has 48 analog oscillators, uh, which is crazy to think about, um, it sounds really, really tight. It doesn't, it doesn't, it sits in a mix nicely. Um, it doesn't overpower. And again, like when we were using a bass from it, a lead from it, a pad, it never felt like they were competing with each other. They did, it did really well. This pedal board I built as like a, a Moog One control station when I first got it. And I wanted to have a couple effects as, so the outputs on, uh, on this thing are, the, the IO is insane. You've got um, inserts and returns on the synth that you can blend in with the normal effects and it puts it into the, the mixer chain just like normal. But what I end up mostly using it for is like when we were doing Children of the Cron, it was my bass effects, phaser and chorus were on this board, but I also had the really, really hard to find uh, Moog MP201, which is just um, an assignable pedal controller. It sends CV outs, but you can make it whatever you want. You can get LFOs, envelopes, or just simple pedal control over it. So, you know, if we'd be sending a sequence to here, you could tweak it and control it with your foot. Like um, we played a lot of live guitars and bass on that. So our hands would be full while we were sending a sequence out to it. But if we wanna sweep a filter or dive bomb the pitch or something like that, you have control over that here. And yeah, it was it, it was specifically built for the Moog One when I when I got it. And that's why this, I used one of these temple boards with the in, inputs and outputs on the, uh, on the actual board. It's a hell of a build. Nice. Yeah, we ended up, we loved those so much. We built a couple more, like Mike, like you see Mike has a couple over here for his setup, but that's, we'll go into more of those later. But um, yeah, that is like, that's like one unit. Yeah. Yeah, when uh, your chorus was noisy, right? So you sent it to Moog. Yeah. And they basically told you, turn it oh, down. Oh, just turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> they, said, they said, turn it down. And they sent me a bill for $80. <laughs> so it's like, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Moog. <laughs> I really feel good about sending stuff to you guys. So we ended up on the Machine Plus. Um, before that, we were using uh, MPC Live, which had a bunch of troubles with us. Like we couldn't really get down to with the workflow. That's where we had all our Mellotron samples and everything. Um, we started out with the RM1X. That failed on me because I think I was just mashing the buttons too hard. And then I got the RS7000, which I still love riding on. I still use those. 
Yeah, we still sample it a bunch too. Yeah, we still sample it. And after that, I went to the MPC 4000. But yeah, we ended on this. Love this, love the workflow. It's great. It had its issues in the beginning, crashes and bugs and such like that. Um, but yeah, and the Circlon used to be the main clock, but when it was sending to me, my delays were jittery. <clears throat> so we ended up using this as the sending the clock. It's That has a tighter clock for sure, but it works just so my delays weren't all weird and jittery and glitchy and such. So is that, that's the centerpiece, is it? So well, to speak, or is it just I would say the clock this and centerpiece? Both of these are do a lot. Like we, It's the clock centerpiece for sure, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, yeah, Sean got me to get one of these, and I think it's great. You know, it sound, the filters are amazing. There's nothing wrong. Like, it's butter. It sounds incredible. Um, so yeah, from the machine, I send out to the Prophet 6 module, and this thing, I fell in love with it immediately. Like, Sean took off the wood blocks <laughs> so it could fit on this board, this synth board, basically, that he made me. Um, Digitone's incredible for FM synth. We both love Sega Genesis scores and, and things like that. Um, Analog Heat, we use on the Machine Plus as warmth and tones and it brings things out. It sounds really good. Um, this is, oh, my Sends, I have this Collider Delay and Reverb uh, by Source Audio. I use the oil can delay because it has a nice warble. And that I mainly use for this, it's like, I call it like my space machine. Like, you know, Hawkwind and Acid Mother's Temple, kind of. And it's not the same every time. So every time you turn it up, it's gonna be slightly different. But we'll use it for like, at the end of the thing into the next thing type of thing like that. So that's basically the setup. You wanna show your pedal word? Oh um, yeah. That we use for like Children of the Cron, if we wanna get yeah, in there. Yeah, so for certain things. Um, yeah, I started building this for Children of the Cron because I was playing guitar, Sean was playing bass, and we were sending out sequences to all of our synths and everything. Eventually it turned into this and two delays, one digital, one analog, chorus, Moog Flanger, the Rainbow Machine, and I have the, uh, what is this, Sean, the Moog? Uh, oh yeah, the Moog expression pedal, yeah. It's set to the pitch on the Rainbow Machine, so you can get extremely warbly and insane with that. Um, we can use it to process stuff too, like not just guitars, like we run drums and stuff. Yeah, like we've sometimes. ran drums through this with through the uh, the Boss DD200 on a very short delay, almost flangy with a high um, uh, feedback to get that, I don't even know what, what you would call that sound, like, you know, the yeah, yeah. super flangy, uh, feedbacky drum sounds. Um, a lot of the tones that we use for Children of the Cron was the fuzz factory with the octave through a phaser, just to get like, I don't know, like almost goblin type of tones. And I think the Mercury 7 reverb is like based on Blade Runner sounds or something like that. I love it. It has like a reverb that melts very slowly in pitch. Like I love the warbly stuff, so. This is like the two hemispheres of the, the Kron live brain. Like this whole U is like the setup here. And we'll play in front of the LED wall too. And just, this is like, welcome to Kron world. This mixer is so insane. I, that's why I was, Mike was saying I, I told him to get one. Cause it was just like, it kind of, it just brought everything in together in a different way that we'd never been able to achieve through modular mixing or, you know, the, the, what is it, the Mix Wizard, like we used to have the Allen and Heath stuff. We tried a couple different setups to, to pull this off. This is more like, I guess you would say DJ oriented. That's why there's a lot of RCA stuff on the back of it. But the way we're using it, it's like Mike has his setup here. It's actually linked to this mixer. So all the main channels come into here, but he has his own discrete high pass and low pass filters on the master. And then each channel actually has their own non-resonant high pass and low pass. Um, he has his own dedicated sends and returns, and it's all right here. These are all stereo channels too, which is cool. So this is, you know, it, technically eight channel and 12 channel. Um, two separate Q outputs, more for DJ stuff, but 
we use them, you know, just for when we're monitoring and we're trying to record or listen to stuff when we're working on new stuff. Um, so anyway, his whole mix is, com his whole side is completely independent. This is Mike's setup and it goes and feeds into this mixer that will then go out to the house. So this mixer, I'm using it in a kind of a similar way. DB25, so to get rid of all the RCA bullshit and having to connect 20 different things at a show, I'll use the DB25 connectors. And that allows me to send every single one of the inputs and all of the sends and returns all from three DB25 cables. So I made these custom modules. They're just format changers. Um, there's no, there's no like knockdown on the gain or anything like that. But these custom Euro modules will take every single one of my outputs and pump it right into here with like no noise. It's incredible. I, it's, it's really, really dialed. It took a long time for us to get it kind of refined like this, easy to set up. Cause performing with modular, you know, I'm sure people know is not the easiest thing in the world. Like there's some sacrifices you have to make. Um, this makes it a hell of a lot easier. It's more, it's more practical. And these mixers just sound insane. Like the filters are so good. It doesn't need a whole lot. You get a sculpting EQ, uh, like a master EQ and the sends and returns. Like it's just, it just does it right. It's really well built and um, yeah. Highly recommended. All analog, zero digital components, um, and then you can take the master out, and you can out, you can also do a breakout and take like the individual tracks out. But yeah, I'm mostly using it to interface with the modular. So the way the modular is set up, I kind of have, you know, I used to have a f dope for wall of terror case that we would bring to shows like Psychopaths, like 800 pounds worth of modular, and uh, you know the back couldn't handle it anymore. So we basically just had to like, we're like, all right, let's 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 mix it up. Let's do some of the drums outside. It allowed a little more flexibility. Like I still love my secret weapons in here for the modular sound and some of the effects. Um, uh, it just, the flexibility is great, but I still wanted to be able to use like some groove boxes with that. So I've kind of supplemented. Always been a circle on dude. I think I've had this thing for 10 years now. Um, I've upgraded it to Circle on 2 and it's the hub for my whole setup. This is basically running every sequence, um, every track, every MIDI connected synth and the, uh, the CV breakout for it. So all of my modular voices, everything controlled by the Circle on. Every part, scene, you know, fill, it's all in here. And I can easily turn stuff on, switch to the next scene. And it's really easy to work with. It's really easy to record new stuff when we're working on a new track. You really never have to stop the track. You can just record and record a new pattern, quantize if you like, adjust, tweak the notes. Um, I basically have kind of uh, instrument definitions set up for all of these synths that have all the relevant track values, you know, your filters and your, your um, oscillator change and um, kit selection and stuff like that. Um, and what I do is I usually save a kit and a preset for each song. And each one of those songs, as soon as you switch, um, all the synths will switch over to the next track. You switch the song, it goes back, um, and that makes it a hell of a lot easier. And you can do that 10 times in a song if you want. You could have verse, chorus, bridge, and have a different preset or patch. And you know, considering the amount of sounds, like on the digitone, that's four separate tracks that you could tweak throughout the whole thing. Um, and what I'll do, everything actually goes through the modular before it hits the mixer. So your drums, those are pretty much vanilla. Those go right into the breakout. The breakout will then take the DB25, put it into the modular. For everything else, like the Digitone, I can process a little bit like through the Black Hole DSP or uh, in the case of the Pro 2, I can send it through beads and through some other jazz in here if I like. Um, I think the Mini Freak goes through a couple processing things. Um, and I can also mix it in too. You know, we have a lot of sound sources here, usually divided like sound sources, voices, and then effects and utilities in this case. Um, there's a lot of voices, so there's little sub mixers in the modular that kind of break this down into, you know, digestible things. Drums, bass, um, digitone, mm, it's like mini freak and uh, Mini Freak and Reich Vector Wave, and then like the Pro 2 and the uh, the Deckard's voice, kind of like sculpted 
in similar areas to where there's nothing bleeding on each other. I don't have a base and a lead in the same track, stuff like that. But it's really, it's really simple. It's really simple. It looks like chaos, but it's pretty simple. Um, this thing is insane. It's kind of like a um, FM wavetable. It's very, it's, it has rem, uh, it's reminiscent of like the DO5, but in a module, this company is incredible, uh, Reich. And uh, you can kind of sweep through the, the sounds with the joystick, um, but it also accepts MIDI. I can send it program changes. It's kind of halfway in between modular and, uh, and a MIDI synth. And then the Deckard's voice, we're using it for um, leads, really big sound. Um, it's kind of like one single oscillator of, of a Deckard's dream or like a CS80. And I'm running that through the Strymon Star Lab for a big washy sound. Um, you know, I think anybody that has Eurorack modular knows like it's, it's an ongoing thing. And this has been 10 years of landing on stuff and trying it out and see what sticks and what you like, what you vibe with. Some stuff you know immediately. Some stuff, you know, you kind of grow out of. A lot of this stuff I've been with for a long time, especially the Intelligel Atlantis. This thing is fucking insane. This is basically a Roland SH-101 in a module. And uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It sounds so good. We use it like on every track. Um, that's like one of my little, little, uh, the second bass from the modular is actually the Mysteron. The Make Noise Mysteron is discontinued as well as the MMG. I run it through the MMG, it's kind of an acid filter, and this thing is like my... It's... I, I can't get it with anything else. I've never been able to achieve that sound. We've gotten close with a couple sounds in uh, Prism, Prism. Prism in, in the machine, which is kind of like a, a modal synthesis, like uh, mutable elements, something like that, where you're using kind of like tune delays and waveguides to get that sound. This is special. I, I don't know why every modular owner hasn't purchased one of these, but it's fucking crazy. Like as a percussion instrument, as as many things, it's, it's capable, but it, that is my base weapon. Um, and it sounds crazy in the mix. It, it complements the analog Atlantis really, really nicely. You can kind of play off of each other. Um, I'm just running that through an ALM pip slope for just a really easy uh, AD envelope. Um, yeah, those are the voices. A couple, couple modular voices and a couple uh, hardware synth voices. Everything goes through the, the processing rack, like that bass sound. These bass sounds will run through run through the um, Ruina, Ruina Versio, which is uh, Noise Engineering's um, uh, multi-band distortion module. And I got this thing and I had never heard anything like that. And I pretty much use it all over the place now. Um, got a Trash Master in there by WMD as a, as a secondary distortion, a more like squelchy, violent distortion. Um, they're not used all the time, but to bring them in for flavor is really nice. And a lot of that stuff is just patched in. You can kind of mix it in how you like it, you know? So this patch doesn't change a whole lot. This is not like a, a modular setup where I'm kind of just tweaking stuff the whole way. It's a, I, I've made a groove box out of this. I have my voices and I have my my processing and they, uh, they complement each other really, really nicely. I had a whole insane setup where I would have all my percussion in the modular. I had all the tip top 808, 909 modules, a lot of really, crazy experimental percussion modules. It's all awesome. It's all great, but it's, it's as far as practicality, if you're going to play shows with, it, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but it sounds great. I think we just found other ways to scratch that itch. Um, and this is, feels really, really dialed. These are like my, my, my greatest hits of, of Euro rack stuff.